Welcome, dear viewer. I hope you are having a wonderful night. Tonight, I'll be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. I hope you are warm and ready. Let's begin. I was a correctional officer at a supermax prison. It was near Florence, Colorado. I stayed as an employee there for a half decade. I saw almost everything you can imagine. Escape attempts, stabbings, and riots also. Sharp weaponry was hidden in places you would rather not visualize. These are only some of the more unpleasant occurrences I have dealt with in the past. I am currently writing this on encrypted Wi-Fi from an undisclosed but safe location. I have had a change of careers following the events of the tale I am about to share with you now. I hope that people thinking about becoming prison guards read my story and reconsider any future life choices they will look back on as mistakes. The warden called me into his office on a Monday. During the entire walk down the hallways, I thought of the trouble I could be in. Shut the door, he said, as he looked up at me from his desk after I entered. Those words sealed it in my mind. How much hot water I was in, for some sort of infraction I was not aware of yet. Bureaucratic micromanagement and constant procedural changes were nothing new to me. I still hated petty political grievances. I nodded and sealed the entranceway. He demanded I take a seat, so I did. You're the best officer here he said. I waited for the butt. I anticipated news of the termination. I saw a forced transfer to some mundane position filing paperwork headed my way. I want to give you an opportunity, he said. You will make 600000 in one year. Your benefits will remain unchanged. You would have less oversight than what is available to you now. You would be in a leadership position, albeit an isolated one. That sounds ideal. I said, as my mind swam in the possibilities of how much profit he offered. There are only two things we ask of you. One is that you cannot tell anybody about your new position. Two is that you locate somewhere else. There's a prison in the Arctic, and that is where your life will be for the next 365 days. The confusion must have been readable on my face. If your wife asks, tell her that you are going to a federal academy. There is no cell service or Wi-Fi there. Any contact you make with her must be through snail mail. We will handle the addresses given. If you decline this offer, then this conversation never happened. Do you understand? I contemplated the pros and cons. Before I became a law enforcement officer, I was a bodyguard. I was away from the house for extended periods, even though it would be time with the wife lost. The fortune would help both of us. I agreed. The prison facility was a large compound, not much bigger than the place I had patrolled before. A few things jumped out at me when I first laid eyes on the populace there. They all had wounds on their faces, and they spoke a strange guttural language I was unfamiliar with. Why do they talk in such a bizarre tongue? I asked myself as I walked down the block. The new warden I worked under had the last name Buckley. He had noticeable scar tissue beneath his eyes. His attitude toward me at the beginning was hardly welcoming. If anything, he acted as though I were a burden. He seemed to resent me due to the mere possibility of having to train me on things. One evening, Buckley ordered me to do a cell extraction. Christopher Aluko was the name of the inmate we had to deal with. On the walk there, I asked my boss what Aluko had done to end up here. I'm not allowed to tell you what these scumbags have accomplished to wind up here, Buckley said. He started his career in crime by cannibalizing his sister, though. Tonight, our only goal is to get him moved to the hole. He's proven himself to be way too dangerous to share a space with anyone. The doors of each cell were closer to those of an insane asylum than a prison. They were complete barriers that you could not see through. It was me and three other guards who were about to deal with this high-profile detainee. The supervisor was present, doing the things bosses generally do. That is to say, he remained on standby and did not get his hands dirty. Upon walking in, the first thing I saw was Aluko sitting upright on his cot. I noticed he was huge, 
at least 6 feet 8 and 320 pounds of pure muscle. His skin cracked all over. His face had the normal scarring that I associated with most people in the area. I'm going to need you to stand up and put your hands behind your back, I said. I kept my hand near the holster, where my pepper spray was. Show me respect, and I'll show you the same, I continued. You won't have handcuffs on you for long if you cooperate. You are not better than me, Aluko said. His voice had a baritone quality, which I expected from a man of his size. What I did not realize was how weird it sounded. It was as though four or five people were chanting the words in unison. All right, I said. Let's get you moved to where you need to go. The faster we do this, the better off we'll be. You shot at someone in broad daylight when you were in a gang years ago, Aluko said. It took 10 years for the paranoia to go away. The fear of the cops coming to arrest you for a potential murder before you became a low-grade one yourself. To this day, you don't know if any innocent civilians got caught in the crossfire. We had to restrain his huge arms and place the metal bracelets on his wrists. He laughed all the while. As we brought him to solitary, I thought of his words and how much they unsettled me. They were true, and that story from my past was one I had not told anybody. Near the end of the shift, Buckley went into one of the sniper towers and smoked a cigarette. Since my duties for the day were complete, I took the spiral staircase to the level he stood on. When I saw him, I was only a few inches away from where he puffed. He did not seem to mind or even care about the footsteps behind him. He focused on the distant and lowering winter sun. The caged animal back there said something that he shouldn't have, I said. Part of the job is having thick skin, he said. As he flicked his cigarette over the edge into the snow, he turned around to face me. It's not about that, I said. Did he hurt your poor little feelings? He had an insight into my past that no one has, I said as a bitter taste filled my mouth. Well, that's unfortunate. That means you lied to the oral board when you got into the position you're in now. You shouldn't lie to your employers. I need to know what kind of prison this is, I said as I felt blood rush to my head. Why does everyone have open sores all over their body and face? Are they exposed to some kind of virus? And if so, are we susceptible? Either that or they're always high on something. That would explain why they're always speaking gibberish. Also, how in the hell do they know things that I haven't even told the closest people in my life? Better to do the job assigned. Don't worry about things above your pay grade. Buckley pulled out another pack of cigarettes and lit one. I hope we're not exposed to dangers. We weren't warned about. I'll have to find a way to get the word out. If you break your non-disclosure agreement, it would be far worse than a termination. Your wife back home, the one with the dark curly hair and the nice curves. I'd hate to see the impact of your decisions on her. That was when I grabbed him by the lapels and shoved him to the ground. I considered throwing elbows. The idea of making him taste his blood was satisfying. I did not want to be incarcerated in this den of misery, of all places. Buckley started laughing. What he did next, took me by complete surprise. He patted me on the back with his free hand instead of trying to defend himself or resist. You've proven your point, he said as he pushed on my chest. Now get off of me. I don't want to give the signal to one of my buddies in the next tower. He has a modded Remington 700 pointed at you. I released him. After he stood and brushed some frost off, he made eye contact with me. I respect you for your bravery. Most people wouldn't be willing to do that to me, especially someone below me in rank. Tell you what, I'll shed a little bit of light on what kind of place this is for you. And if I ever find out you told anyone, you'll wish you would have died at birth. I felt the adrenaline start to wear off. As my energy lowered, I nodded, thereby giving tacit agreement to his new offer. I looked to my left and saw the sniper he was referring to. It occurred to me that if he wanted to take action against me, he could have had me executed right then and there. Buckley waved at me to follow him as we made our way down the steps. He escorted me through the yard. Ice encased the weight sets and pull-up bars. We followed the chain link fence to another facility that had coded key access. After we put in the correct digits, 
He swung the door open. We made our way down a hallway that did not seem modern. There were lit torches on the walls. The flooring was pallid cobblestone. He brought me into another room, which was the size of an auditorium. A man stood up. He wore all black clothing with a white collar, and it took me a while to recognize him as a priest. I saw rows of long tables, ones fit for a king in an ancient era. Crucifixes, rosaries, chalices of water, and stacks of dusty books lined every corner. I skimmed some of the titles and saw that a few were in a different language. Father Lamora, Buckley said as he stared at the man of the cloth. What are you doing down here? This was one of the inmates tied down on a slab. As soon as we focused our collective attention on him, the man came to life. He started struggling against his restraints. A red-tinged substance poured from his mouth like foam from a rabid dog. I have almost driven the evil entity out, the priest said. Buckley turned to me. What is going on here? I asked. I had the irresistible urge to run screaming in the other direction. I knew I could not take my chances in the harshest cold, but a part of me was willing to at least try. This prison's budget comes from the Vatican. We only take inmates possessed by something greater than general sadism or psychopathy. In the official government paperwork, they call this place the House of the Demonium. If you want to atone for the sins I know you are guilty of, now would be an excellent time. Help us read the incantation needed to cleanse this heathen. I was a correctional officer at a supermax prison. It was near Florence, Colorado. I stayed as an employee there for a half decade. I saw almost everything you can imagine. Escape attempts, stabbings, and riots, these are only some of the more unpleasant occurrences I have dealt with in the past. I am currently writing this on encrypted Wi-Fi from an undisclosed but safe location. I have had a change of careers following the events of the tale I'm about to share with you now. I worked in a hidden prison in the Arctic full of possessed inmates. I hope people thinking about becoming prison guards read my story and reconsider. I do not want them to make future life choices they will look back on as mistakes. Our possessed inmates were flown in from around the world. The evening the young girl came to our gates via bus was an unusual occurrence. The transporting officers rolled her towards me on a gurney. She fought against her restraints. She screamed in the dense and layered voice I'd become used to at that point. She wore a tattered old beige dress. Bloodstains marked her clothing. I made a mental note to try and get her some blankets once she was in her new home. Her name was Anna. There were a few things that made her different from the others. For starters, her eyes were milky. She retained the same faraway gaze they all had, but it was as though her pupils indicated narcotic use. Her eyes never got any clearer during the entirety of my time monitoring her. There was one singular trait that made her stand out from the others. She often quieted down in her yelling once she was in the presence of the staff. The inmates usually never cared who they were in front of unless it was to unearth our secrets or shame us. She minded her manners. This was as alarming as it was respectful. Once I placed her in the cell, I knew I had to bind her to the bed after removing her from the gurney. As soon as I unbuckled one of the straps on her wrists, she reached up and tried to claw at my face. I ducked her stripe. I reached toward my belt for a canister. If this were a normal prison, it would have been filled with mace. Mine brimmed with holy water instead. I sprayed at her. Smoke emanated from her skin as she let out a cry of anguish. I undid the rest of the straps and moved her to the bed. I shut the door and went to lunch. The lodging for the employees was three separate rows of cabins. The most luxurious ones belonged to the leadership. The second most comfortable apartments were for the priests. The third, and needless to say, the most decrepit, provided shelter for the officers. Even though my space was hardly glamorous, it became my sanctuary. I was able to work out, read paperback books, and journal. These activities helped maintain my mental sanity. I stared at the ceiling and thought about how unsettled I was about the girl. Every inmate had a glimmer of humanity. Something about her made me want to investigate her past. Word spread amongst the employees about how there was only one computer in the entire facility. It contained the report database. 
It was in our warden's office. Rumors also circulated that he had access to the inmates' rap sheets. Buckley had verified this for me in one of our prior conversations, though it was an accident. I waited until after hours to enter Buckley's space. I managed to bribe one of the janitors with extra snacks. Never underestimate the power of common items in the penitentiary. Buckley had left his computer on without signing out. Navigating the digital database of various inmate profiles was tricky. While I wanted to look up different names, I decided to focus on the young girl. I searched for every Anna until I found the one I was looking for. A few things stood out to me about her right away. The main body of text on her infractions had many redactions. I printed it out and grabbed the papers. I closed the door behind me and headed down the hallway, back to my lodging. I read the document on my walk. Even though she was only 20 years old, she was also a nuisance to society. She burned down a halfway house that she was staying at. She was there for many Deweys. Several judges gave her breaks. They decided to put her in mental health facilities instead of jail. She kept assaulting the staff there. The worst of these was when she stabbed a nurse in the jugular. The Rern survived, but had to talk through a voice box for the rest of her life. I was right outside my door when I heard a familiar voice. You're out late, CO, Nosu said. I turned around and saw his large frame. In the two months I had been there, I got to know the man well. He had come here from the Arizona State Prison Complex. We swapped similar stories. His tales of the encounters he had with death row prisoners intrigued me. What do you have there? No Sue asked. A guidebook on how to perform a successful exorcism. I lied. I didn't think you liked working off duty. We do what we have to. How did you get it? They won't let us use the internet here. I found it under the seat of the mobile unit, I said. I did not feel good about falsifying information for a peer I had respect for. Oh, I see. I came here to ask if you had any extra coffee. I'm out, and I don't want to go all the way to my locker to get some in the morning if I can help it. No problem, I said as I unlocked the door and invited him in. I stuffed the papers under my mattress so he would not be able to read them. I reached into my backpack and pulled out some instant packets. I gave them to him and I saw that he stared at my collection of books. At the far end was a Bible. His eyes were locked on it. He grabbed the coffee packs and looked at me. Do you believe what they're telling us? Nosu asked. What do you mean? About God and the devil. All these biblical villains are taking control of all the people here. It seems far-fetched to me. There has to be something more going on. What if this is an asylum for those with undiagnosed mental illnesses? The kind researchers aren't advanced enough to understand yet. Have you ever thought of that? I sat down. I don't think science has the answer, I said. The ones in here are gifted with preternatural abilities. It's like they can read our minds, or at least our pasts, no matter how secretive we are. I never felt as though I had less power than I do since I came here. All I know is that I can't pretend to understand everything, whether it's celestial or empirical. I cannot feign understanding of the evil within these walls. To pretend otherwise is arrogance. Buckley, no Sue, a priest, and I walked together to Anna's cell. We could hear her screaming from within a hundred foot distance. The other laments of the prisoners became drowned out by her wails. We entered her cell. Words written in blood were on the wall. She stared at us with a smile. Her face seemed puppier than usual which emphasized the wounds on her face. The priest pulled out a rusted black crucifix. He raised it in her direction as he approached her. Her screams grew louder with each advancing step. He pulled out a small pocket Bible and read a prayer from it. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray and do thou O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world for that ruin of souls. Amen. Her eyes became less opaque. I was able to make out their green color for the first time. She gazed at me 
and spoke intelligible words for the first time since her forced visitation. Your mother died an early death because she found out you joined a gang, Anna said with a mocking laugh. I looked around to see if anyone was staring at me with judgment. The expressions were neutral until they turned to worry. Everyone in the room knew they would have to wait their turn for public humiliation. You accepted a bribe to stay silent after an inmate stabbed another one to death, she said to Nosu. Nosu muttered something under his breath. He stated that the inmate was a horrible person who mistreated children. He commented on how the earth was lighter without the presence of a person weighing it down. You, Anna said as she stared at Buckley, are the worst out of everyone. Your wife dies by drowning and you receive her life insurance money. Wait until they look deeper into that. What I saw next horrified me. Buckley screamed out the word no as he lunged at her. His hands wrapped around her throat before one of her legs broke free from its binding and kicked him in the ribs. He must have forgotten to wear his vest that day because he folded and landed on the ground. The priest placed the cross on her forehead and left a permanent mark there. She passed out. Her exhalation before she lost consciousness made her body deflate into an unnatural thinness. Buckley called me into his office the next day. He asked me to take a seat with a menacing tone. He slammed the door and sat behind his desk. Do you even want to work here anymore? I know this employment opportunity is very unique. It's not for everyone. You knew when you became ACO that this type of job requires more mental fortitude than most professions. This isn't any different because we're operating in uncharted territory. Have I done something wrong? I asked. You entered my office after hours, he said as he banged his fists on the table. I don't know what your motivation was. Are you starting to believe some of what these inmates are saying about me? They don't see our sins with full impunity. They know enough about our interior lives and what bothers us to get under our skin. It is us versus them. Once you side with the enemy, then you're no good to the team here, let alone me. If you're running some kind of vigilante investigation against me, two can play that. Believe me when I say you don't want to be on my bad side. If you're going to fire me, I said I won't make excuses. You should know I was not trying to get you into trouble or dig up any dirt. I wanted to look up any information I could on Anna. She seemed to be more in control of what possessed her than the others. I wanted to figure out what made her so unique in that regard. I wanted to figure out what made her so unique in that regard. Figured if I ever wound up possessed, I could weaponize whatever she used. You're like a child, he said as he stood and paced back and forth. Do yourself a favor and stay within your pay grade. The Vatican has hired scientists to study behavior during possessions. In the old days, they would have dismissed them as different demons. You don't have a degree in microbiology any more than I do. We are hired to make sure the demonologists are safe when they do their job. So you do yours. Yes, sir. I felt as though I had backed down and given him some sort of sovereignty over me. I also knew that if I lied or resisted, it would only lead to a loss of money for my family and me. Count yourself lucky, he said as he sat back down and picked up a pen. I'm not reporting your mistake to any of my superiors. Do not make me regret giving you this break. Now get out of here before I change my mind. I made my way to the threshold. I faced him as I began to turn the knob. One question, I said. Most of the time, inmates come here in groups. Anna arrived alone. Why was she given special treatment during her transport? Is she a celebrity? The daughter of a famous politician. It's within my rights to know as someone who has to check up on her. Anna is my daughter. Buckley said as he scribbled on a pad and motioned for me to leave. 